Support for The Bittersweet Life comes from HarperCollins, presenting The Angel of Rome by Jess Walter, a stunning collection of tender and brilliant stories about the moments when life changes you, for the better or the worse. It just keeps happening, Rome, over and over, the city reinventing itself for each new generation. And us, too, I suppose, if we have the courage and the people to show us the way. That's Eduardo Ballerini reading from The Angel of Rome, the latest story collection by best-selling author Jess Walter. A starred Kirkus review says that you should prepare for delight. And you should. The Angel of Rome by National Book Award finalist Jess Walter. Available now wherever books or audiobooks are sold. Hello, I'm Tiffany Parks, and this is A Bittersweet Moment with Katie Sewell. Hello, this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell, and this is your midweek bittersweet moment. And I am not alone today. I am with Tiffany and my mutual friend, Suzanne. Hi. Very popular, (laughs) at least in our minds, if not on the show. Although people did love your two-part episode. This summer, we are spending this summer in Rome, but as it stands, it's the 4th of July when we're recording this, and I'm actually in Seattle, breaking the fourth wall. Uh, But since we just heard on Monday this interview with Darlene about moving abroad as a woman who had a wonderful job, career in New York City and decided to move anyway, I wanted to talk to you because you, as a young woman did what I kind of wished I had the courage to do. Rather than go right to college, you went abroad instead. And I thought, tell us what you did and why you did that. So um, senior year of high school, when everybody was applying for colleges, I started to do the application process. And then I was like, I want to do too many things. I can't decide what college I would want to go to when I want to do all of these things. I wanted to study not just one language, I wanted to study at least three. Like I had this idea of like being a polyglot, but I also knew I wanted to do theater and I also knew I was uh, a musician and I wanted to write. Um, So I was like your classic 18 year old dilettante. Um, Oh, and I wanted to be a philosopher and um, who knows what else. But I, I was just, I had so many interests and and, but especially the languages, I knew I really wanted to get good at languages as fast as possible. And the best way to do that was to go abroad. Um, but also, I just sort of felt like, um, I don't know, I, I, I just didn't feel like I wanted to stay on the treadmill of life. I remember having this really distinct feeling, even before I made the decision, so like junior year of high school, I kind of went through this depression almost where all of a sudden I was like, we all really are going to die. And we really only have this one life, this finite experience. And it just struck me as like deeply, deeply sad that we sort of get on this treadmill when we're in kindergarten and we sort of never get off of it. And so I have this really strong memory of just deciding like, I don't know if you've watched Game of Thrones, but Daenerys Targaryen is always like, I'm going to break the wheel. And that was sort of how I was about this treadmill. I was like, I'm going to break the treadmill. Like, I will not stay on the treadmill. And I'm going to start now. Like, I'm going to start now with like messing with the treadmill. Now, if I'd been raised in like England or Europe or something like that, like gap years, that's what they call them there, right? Just a gap year, especially I think in England, that's what they call it. Um, Very normal thing to do there. It wasn't where we grew up at all, right? Like, it was really unusual to take time off between high school and college. But I'd had a couple older family friends who had done it. So they had sort of, like, shown me um, that that was possible. In their cases, they stayed home and, like, worked and just took a year off. But I ended up taking two and a half years off because it took me a while to save money to go to Europe in the first place. And, um, yeah. But anyway, but it was all about really, like, I don't want to do life 
in this normal way. I don't want to do it where like you go to school and then you go directly to college and in college you find your spouse and then you get out of college and you find your job and then pretty soon you have some kids and then you have your spouse, your job and your kids and you buy a house and you like do that and then you die. I had no interest in that. And interestingly enough, I'm 45 years old now and I still deeply dislike that whole concept. So, (laughs) (laughs) So nothing's changed. Were your parents in favor of it? Um, they were. They were supportive for sure. My dad was very much into it. My dad spent about 10 years of his childhood in Germany and um, he was an army brat and so they lived all over the world. My mom was a little nervous, I think. I think just nervous to have her kid that far away from her. Um, and my dad was like, she'll be safer in Europe than she'd be in America. Like, <laughs> safer there than anywhere in this country. So I think my dad was really excited about it and my mom was she was she was happy but she was also I think just anxious in that way that a mother would be of like you're going to be too far for me to manage you mm-hmm. and what are you going to do with boys with boys <laughs> Did, was she ever worried that you wouldn't go to college mm, I don't think so I don't think either of my parents doubted that I would go to college because I was so into the subjects I was into mm-hmm. um, and I was so ambitious. I was just ambitious in a really different way. You know, it wasn't about like getting into this or that school or, you know, getting a 4.0. I mean, I was not that kind of student at all. I was getting like a D minus in the trigonometry class that you and I took together, Katie, <laughs> as you might recall, because I never went to that class, but then A pluses in the things I was interested in. So I was always really sort of self-directed in that way. So I think, and my parents are in their own way like that as well. Very much like if you're interested in something, go hard ahead. So I was always really surprised because even some of my friends, not you, I don't remember you ever doing this or, or Tiffany, but I I won't name any names, but I'll tell you after this <laughs> who it was. Um, they were like, well, you're not going to go to college. You're just going to end up being one of those like losers on Mercer Island who just like goes to Denny's all the time and <laughs> yes. doesn't go to college and smokes pot and stuff, which is funny because I never smoked pot. Hang on. It's a second. niece, I think. Somebody's, Somebody's knocking on the door. It's Claire. Claire, do you want to come in and just sit quietly? Okay, everyone, this is my niece, Claire. Come say hello. Hi. This is uh, Suzanne's niece, Claire. And how are you? Good. (laughs) And how old are you? Five. What are you into? What's your favorite thing? Hugging my sister. (laughs) Oh, hugging your sister. That's so nice. She's a big sister. She's a big sister? How much bigger? She's eight and a half. Mm. Would you say that you admire your sister? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, you want to come sit with me, honey? We're, we're I need to go potty. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, you want to close that door, sweetie, before you do that so the listeners don't have to hear you? Yeah, here, I'll help you shut the door. Okay. Thank you. All right. <laughs> okay, she'll be back later. Um, <laughs> so if you can hear all the music, by the way, it's because we're at a 4th of July party right now, <laughs> and there's a lot of people around. Okay, so you say you're gone, for, you take two and a half years off, and you have to work to get to go, but how long are you actually gone for once you actually go? A little bit less than a year, mm-hmm. I believe. And where were you? Um, primarily in Munich and Paris. And um, I was sort of based in Munich uh, with a family uh, who, She's were, done. who were family friends. And then I had a boyfriend at the time who was living in Paris. And so I was also spending a lot of time there with him. And um, yeah, but then I bopped around a lot during that period of time as well. Mm -hmm. Did you ever consider staying? You know, I ran out of money and didn't really have a way to work. And also that boyfriend was a really bad boyfriend and I really needed to get away. And it was my first taste of like the benefit of leaving an ex on another continent. So that was really great to like put an ocean between me and this person. So by that point, it was it was really good to come home, and I was ready. I mean, I, I was ready, and I wasn't. You know, coming home was also, um, you know, it's a challenge to switch gears like that. Mm-hmm. And I had gotten really accustomed to living in Europe, and I really liked it. Hi, Claire. Hi, Claire. Mary. You got to steer, go. So at the time, it was, like, pretty clear I needed to come home. But as soon as I got home... I started thinking about maybe going back, but then things took a different direction. Mm -hmm. After that, you went to college. What was it like for people who are young, going into college, thinking about going into college, 
What was it like for you to go into college as an older person? Not that you were that much older, but you were older than the freshman class. Yeah, I mean, I started college at 21. So I had two choices. Ultimately, I was choosing between Smith College and the University of Washington. And it ultimately came down to money. I knew if I went to Smith, I would be terribly in debt when I got out. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother was willing to pay for the equivalent of UW, basically. And so I could go to college for free, or I could graduate with about $150,000 in debt. And I knew I wanted to be an artist of some kind. I was going to be a writer or a theater artist or both. And um, and I was old enough at that point to be practical about that. Like I actually, whereas I wasn't at 18 when I was first looking at colleges, um, money was not meaningful in that way. Whereas having lived abroad for a year and worked for a year before that to go, I really understood what a dollar was. And 150,000 of them was like a huge <laughs> amount to be responsible for when I knew I was going to be an artist. And it's um, time. Oh, it's sparkler time. All right, girls. Have a good time. All is well. recording. We're recording an episode. Okay. Bye bye. Bye, Claire. Can I join you? Please. So you can say hello, introduce yourself. Subscribe to the show, please. <laughs> That's Jill, my very good friend and parent to these two lovely ladies. Um, hi. Who are you? I'm Myla. And how old are you? I'm eight years old and I'm going into third grade. And how are you related to Claire, who's standing here next to us? She's my sister. <laughs> and um, are you the younger sister or the older sister? Obviously older. <laughs> well, they can't see you. The listeners can't see you. And what would you say you're most interested in right now? Um, camp. Camp. Oh, camp is a good answer. Claire, can you bounce on one foot? Why do you take the bouncing on one foot? Yeah, you have to go sparkler zone because Uncle Kurt's going to want to do some sparklers. Yes, and we'll be down in three minutes. Or you, or you can sit here if you're going to be quiet and listen, but Katie needs to finish her interview so we can go have fun. Are you a news reporter or something? Yes, <laughs> a very serious news reporter. Very, very serious. <laughs> Only serious topics. <laughs> okay, so lie here and be cute. Okay. Sparklers. Okay, sparklers. sparklers. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Right <laughs> Those are your nieces. They are. Oh, that's lovely. They're pretty great. Yes. All right, so we were saying. Oh, so yes, yeah, so I had these two colleges that like oh, yes. I was debating between and ultimately it really came down to money. But it, I think in the end that was really good because UW was a huge school. But for me being older, that was great because it meant all my friends were grad students. I think if I had gone directly into like a, a small you know, little potted ivy, as they call them, liberal arts college with a mm -hmm. bunch of eight, and I was like in a dorm room with a bunch of 18-year-olds, I think that would, would not have been a great fit for me at that point. Because mm -hmm. I was 21, and I'd also like had jobs, and I had traveled a ton, and I was just older, you yeah. know, when I started in that way that like 21 and 18 really are very different ages. And so most of my friends, I also had a lot of friends who were like me, like who had started college and then maybe like developed, you know, like a pot problem. That <laughs> so they dropped out of college for a couple of years and then like got serious and started up again and were like more grown up. So I had a lot of friends who were, you know, more in that category of, of people who had lived a little bit and were a little bit older. And then, like I said, a lot of my friends were just grad students. And so I also was old enough to like talk my way into a lot of grad student classes and so I was able to kind of create a small smaller college experience out of this huge college that I was in but it ended up being really good for me it was a good fit in the long run which I was nervous about because I wanted to go to one of those like you know tiny little schools and major in aesthetics or something you know <laughs> it was really different Monday's episode if you haven't listened to it yet go back and listen when we were talking with Darlene, and Darlene, she did some study abroad as well, but she had this lifelong dream of living abroad and hadn't done it and hadn't done it, gotten a great job, had boyfriends, had great friends, had all these reasons why you kind of don't go, and yet it's this nagging thing at the back of her head where it's, you know, if you don't do this, you'll regret it. Mm -hmm. You'll regret it, and eventually she decides that she must go, and she does leave it all behind. But for you, after doing all that travel as a young person... Did you ever get that nagging feeling like 
as a 30, 20, 30, 40 year old somebody that was like, I should be living somewhere else now. I should be more worldly than I am. Mm. Um, I don't know. Cause after that, you know, I did college and then I went to Indonesia for a couple months and then I moved to New York and then eventually found my way back to Seattle and, um, you know, still did a fair bit of traveling, although not very much in the last number of years for lots of different reasons, COVID included. But no, I mean, I think that like doing it at that age meant that I really, I love traveling. I love it. But I also saw, um, you know, because I, I met a lot of Americans who lived in Europe. I think I'd had this idea that you'd become a whole different person. It, you'd be so unconventional and bohemian living. And it was like, no, you just learn new conventions. You know, because every, every culture has its conventions. And I think Americans often really do love to um, jettison their American selves mm-hmm. and just take on the conventions of wherever they are. But it's still conventional in a certain sense. And so I, I think I saw really early on how we're all pretty conformist. <laughs> you know, even when you do something unconventional, we often do it in ways that are conforming to what unconventional looks like. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Um, and that, so I, that was sort of great for me because it gave me a little more confidence in making choices that didn't look as bohemian as I thought I needed to be as an artist, you know, to have a more stable life, you know, or to value a more, a quieter life, which as a writer became very important Mm -hmm. to me. So I feel like for me, it it was, I wouldn't say it was like I got it out of my system. I wouldn't say it was anything like that exactly. Cause you know, if I were offered the opportunity to live in like Berlin for a year or two or anywhere for a period of time, I would probably be intrigued and want to do it and do it. Um, But to actually like go live or like move abroad and stay, I don't really, well, okay. So my husband's family, his uh, grandparents, three of his four grandparents were off the boat from Denmark and Norway. Mm. And so during the Trump years, (laughs) his sisters and I were like, how can we get Norwegian citizenship? How can we get Danish citizenship? Like, just in case we all want to, like, get out of here. Or just to go retire somewhere else. It was sort of a joke, but it was also not, you know, for a couple of his sisters who really did do the research to figure out. Because yeah. in a lot of European places, if you have grandparents, you can get citizenship. And I thought about that for a little while. I was like, that could be kind of interesting to go, yeah, just to jettison everything in that way but at the same time it's not really me like I I really have deep deep roots here and um yeah I would I would love to go places for a a discreet period of time Mm. you know and uh, including like a year or two like I could see myself doing something like that but anything longer than that um I don't think so Mm. I think I'm, I'm I'm here yeah at least you know part way I'm here (laughs) if that makes sense in the Pacific Northwest not necessarily Seattle forever but Pacific Northwest well and is it because of the Pacific Northwest or is it because of the people who are here I think it's both Mm. I mean I think there is something about climate change that I feel grateful to live in a place where it is terrifying in August when we have the smoky incredibly hot days that we've never had that time of year Mm -hmm. before Um, but it's still nothing compared to what the rest of the country and so much of the world is experiencing so I think my anxiety about climate change also makes me happy to be here but also I'm very deeply rooted to this landscape it is so important to me um, that uh, that I'm in it I guess not just Seattle's but like um, you know, the rainforests here and the islands and even, you know, heading east through the Cascades, the mountain ranges. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm just really connected to it. And I feel really fed by it and really inspired by this landscape. Which is interesting for me as your friend, mm-hmm. because you've spent much more time away from this landscape than I have. Mm. And so for me, sometimes I think, am I connected to it or I'm just, is this just, am I stuck here? <laughs> I know, but I think that is like, I think that's the crucial question of home. Yeah. Like wh- whoever you are, wherever you live, we feel so deeply rooted, not everybody, but if you do feel deeply rooted to home, there can also be a quality of like, am I rooted or am I stuck? And I think it all depends on, 
I don't know, like, are you getting energy from where you are? Or do you feel stagnant staying put? Because um, I think if you, if you do feel stagnant, it's probably time to get up and go, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. might need a break. I've already gone a bunch of places. <laughs> yeah. Okay, one more question, and then we're done. Did it surprise you when Tiffany left? No, not at all. I mean, Tiffany and I had been talking about her moving to Italy as long as I had known her. I think it surprised me only insofar as the moment she decided to go, it was like she had no plan other than like, I'm going to go and I'm going to make it work. And like vaguely going to stay with some relatives for like five minutes at the at the onset of her living there. So that was impressive for sure. But I think the moment that was more surprising was when she was like, I'm never coming home. This is where I'm going to be now. Like, I don't think I'm ever going to come home. And I was out with you and Tiffany. We were at the People's Pub in Ballard, Mm -hmm. which no longer exists, (laughs) RIP. We were probably in our late 20s, I'm guessing, maybe 30 at the oldest. Yeah. And she was like, you know how dramatic Tiffany is. I don't know if you (laughs) listeners know how dramatic (laughs) Tiffany is. But she was like, you guys, I'm never coming home. Like she said it with like she like it was just dawning on her in that moment. And yeah. and I remember being like, she really isn't going to. And and what's funny now is I'm like, but maybe she will now. Who knows? Like maybe they'll you never know. But um but I think that was more surprising to me because for most of us, going abroad was something that you did for a year or two, or even in some cases five or six years or seven or eight years. I have lots of family members who lived abroad for, you know, upwards of ten years, but they all came home eventually um and so i think it's it's really interesting when someone just simply doesn't ever yeah um and they truly stay there and they and they become a part of that culture or at least they become the culture becomes a part of them or something Mm -hmm. like i think that's really really interesting and i do know some people who are older who have lived abroad you know since they were in their 20s and now they're in their 60s and they have such wistfulness about home and one in fact was telling me she's like I just think I want to buy a house in in Ohio just in case I want to go back in my 80s you know so it's like there's still that's what I think is interesting is living with that lingering question for your whole life of like will I still at some point and the idea that that might never end that you might still be like 65 and be like but maybe when I'm 80 Mm -hmm. maybe then I'll move home yeah that's lovely All right, we're going to leave it there. And until next time, this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. I'm Suzanne Morrison. (laughs) Talk to you soon. Bye. The Bittersweet Life is produced and edited by me, Katie Sewell. My co-host is Tiffany Parks. If Rome is in your travel plans, be sure to arrange a historical tour with Tiffany. To set it up, send us a note through the Contact Us page at thebittersweetlife.net. Also, you could sponsor this show and reach thousands of engaged thinkers and travel lovers all over the world. Send us a note at thebittersweetlife.net to get the conversation started. Our logo is designed by Jody Rick at the Lost Laboratory, web help from Drew Atkins. And this show continues when listeners support it. Tell a friend to subscribe, write us a review, and like you would with any other art you appreciate, tip your podcaster don't steal the tea find ways to toss a donation in the hat at thebittersweetlife.net thank you and thanks for spending the summer in rome with us